We're in a series that we're kicking off for the month of April called We the Church. We the Church. As we talk about our mission and our values based upon what we're about at CBC, this is the uniqueness of what this church, I'm grateful for the capital C church. How many of you know this? Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. We understand that plan A was the church to reach the world. Not plan B, plan A. It's through a body of people, a fellowship of brothers and sisters, togetherness, that the glory of God is put on display for a world to see. And God's looking for a church to pour out his purpose and his meaning that we would actually not just choose to hear his word, but to do his word, to be living, breathing testimonies and examples of what he's asked us to live out, which is this great commandment to love God and love people. And today I want to share a message entitled, We Celebrate Life Change. As we talk about our mission statement, our mission statement is we champion every person to be the good news of Jesus in every place. Listen, if we're trying to change the world from San Antonio, Texas, it can't just be one dude with a microphone preaching Jesus. Y'all with me? We all got to preach this message. Come on, somebody get excited about what I'm saying right now. We all got to preach this message. You got to share this message of Jesus. You got to tell people about Jesus, not just by the way you live your life, but we got to open up our mouth and to our hearing impaired congregation, we got to use our hands. We got to tell people about what Christ has done for us. You go, Ed, I don't know what to say. It's your story. Tell them about what Jesus has done in your heart and your life. You're like, but I don't know how, how to rebuttal the questions they will ask. You don't have to have all the answers. You just know the answer. His name is Jesus. And as you begin to preach this message of Jesus, may you recognize that some people, some people will only listen to you. They are not, not going to listen to a preacher sometimes. But I want to just say thank you in advance for how you represent and you continue to live a life as ambassadors for who Christ is. But today we want to talk about our values you go, Ed, what's the difference between a mission statement? This is what we're aiming for, that every person would be the good news of Jesus in every place. But what are the value statements? The value statements are what is said about us as a church when we're not in the room? What, what is our reputation as a church? We want to just condense this down to four statements, that we celebrate life change. Next weekend, we'll talk about practicing radical generosity the following weekend, we'll talk about building kingdom family. And the weekend after that, to round out the month of April, we'll talk about delivering real hope. As we talk about celebrating life change, if heaven celebrates the one saying yes to Jesus, so shall we. We got to be a church that celebrates people. And what I love about what you just witnessed in this room, the reason why we celebrate baptism the way that we do this, which is different, how many of you would just testify that you've never seen baptism like this until you walked into this room? How many of you would just testify, all right? You've never seen baptism like this. I need you to know the reason why we celebrate like this was because of one story. His name's Juan. True story, his name's Juan. And Juan specifically was going to kill himself at a hotel down the road. He checked into a hotel. He pulled out the Gideon Bible. He was so mad at God. First of all, let me just say thank God for those Gideon Bibles pulled out the Bible, put it on the floor, took his revolver, and was going to shoot the Bible, mad at God. But watch this. He opened up to the New Testament and began to read verses in red, the red letters, gave his life to Jesus, put the revolver up, chose not to kill himself, but chose to receive the grace of God, was driving by our church, saw our digital sign. God told him, go there. They'll love you. He came to the meet and greet. I stand in the hallway at the end of every service out here, and I'll do it again after this service. He walked out there, head down low, tattoos all over his face and neck. And in that moment, he tells me that story, but he won't look at me. And when I heard that story, I said, Juan, lift your eyes. You do not walk in shame in this place. You are a part of the family of God, and you belong here. You belong here. Juan gets baptized. Now, you, you didn't see this, but behind the LED wall, we had a platform, and many of you celebrated your family members that would walk across the stage. They now get into the choir loft, but when we first did this, he had no one cheering for him. No family members standing on a stage. No, no individuals celebrating him, and so the stage would look into the baptistry, and we're talking like in the splash zone at SeaWorld. I'm talking like right here. Nobody was there. 
Myself, Pastor Matt, we just happened to be standing there. We stepped forward, we cheered on one. And while I was standing there, the Spirit of God just spoke in my heart, never again, never again. Invite people to stand up in that loft and cheer for every single person. So the reason why we celebrate life change that way is because there was a guy that had nobody cheer for him. We cheered for him. I'm not talking about we as a church cheered for him, but he had no family, no friends standing with him. And so God just deposited this in my spirit. Then we gotta be his family. We gotta be his friends. We gotta cheer. We gotta clap. And that's the reason why we celebrate the way we celebrate. But I wanna just turn your attention to Luke chapter 15, where Jesus helps us understand a significant teaching through three parables. You go, Ed, what's a parable? It's a heavenly story with an earthly meeting. Jesus was the greatest storyteller of all. And in Luke chapter 15, if you're with me today in not just this room, but also an overflow, come on, need some encouragement today. Come on, did you say amen? We ready for the word? Here it is, Luke chapter 15. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. That's a very interesting word because it says they were indignant angry, frustrated, and they began to complain. What was their complaint? This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Now, if you got something to write with and something to write down on, which would be the listener guide, why don't you just fill in blank number one. We see the purpose of the parables. Why did Jesus tell three stories that really was one story? And let me just go ahead and give away the reveal here. Jesus tells three stories that's really one story. Lost, found, party. Come on, let me say that again. Lost, found, party. He tells three stories that's really one story. He tells three stories that's really one story. He tells three stories this is really one story because there is a theme and a thread through the three stories that's really a one story. Lost, found party. Now, why would he tell three stories? It's really one story, lost, found party, because he's eating with tax collectors and sinners and the religious leaders known as the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, indignant, angered. He eats with sinners. By the way, can we just take a moment to go, thank you, Jesus, that you ate with sinners. Because if you ain't thanking Jesus right now, then you have to understand you're the sinner. I'm the sinner. And Jesus didn't look at us and go, hey, you get your life fixed up, cleaned up, and then I'll eat with you. No, he ate with us while we were still sinners. And they began to grumble. You know why? Because these individuals, the tax collectors and sinners, were outcasts, they were overlooked, they were seen and labeled by their lifestyle. The religious leaders were so dignified, religiously astute, following all the rules of the Old Testament. Jesus would actually say this later, you look for eternal life in the scripture, but I'm the one it's speaking about. You're you're trying to obey the commandments to earn salvation, And they were very proud of the fact that by their discipline and their devotion, they thought by my efforts of religion, I'm going to heaven. And so when they watch Jesus eat with sinners, they begin to grumble. Jesus tells three stories that really speaks to two groups of people. Come on, church, lean into this. He speaks to the sinners and he's speaking to the religious people at the same time. He tells three stories. That's really one story. Come on, help me with this. That this has one principle attached to it. Lost, found, come on, let me, let me see if I can get this side. Y'all got to help me a little bit on this side. Lost, found, overflow. All right, come on in. We got to help them with overflow. Lost, found, party. But the religious leaders are going, we ain't lost. And because we ain't lost, we ain't got to be found. So why are we going to party? But if you're lost and you don't know you're lost and you get found and then there's a party, you go, what have I been missing? And why did I stay lost trying to find a party somewhere else when there's nothing like a Holy Ghost party? Come on. Now, 
I, I, I don't have time to, to stay here, but I got to speak to something. He afflicts the comfortable in the religious leaders of the day, and he comforts the afflicted at the same time. Afflicts the comfortable, comforts the afflicted. In these three stories, that's really one story. Lost, found, party. Yeah. For anybody in the room, you, you know that the Pharisees, what they were claiming when they said he eats with them, you know what they were saying? He affirms their lifestyle. But that's not what Jesus was doing. Now, when we talk about Jesus associating with them, there's a distinct difference between affiliation and affirmation. Affiliating with them was a statement of, I see you, I'm for you, I disagree with you, but I care for you and love you. You may think that's hateful, that I don't affirm what you're doing, but actually it's the opposite. That the very thing that you're accusing me of stands in opposition to what you're saying because if I really hated you, then why am I still hanging out with you? What, if I really hated you, why do I pray for you and care for you and love you and serve you? Just because I don't affirm you doesn't mean I don't love you. We just disagree, but my love is working through the disagreement. So we're going to recognize that Jesus does not affirm the lifestyle. And let me just be real clear because you go, Ed, we have created a top 10 list, have we not, in churches? Homosexuality, transgenderism, we talk about this here often, stands in opposition to what the Word of God says. However, at the same time, we would say, you're welcome here. At the same time, you are loved here. No one will look down upon you here. Everybody's at a different place in the journey, but we have to be careful. Here's the reason why I say that, and I know it's kind of created some tension in the room. I, I know you feel it. I know you feel it. But for the very person that says, but they're, they're not welcome here, they're, they don't belong here, and I've said it before, then I would say the pharisaical mindset that you have that they're not welcome here is what Jesus is addressing. It's what Jesus is saying, so where will they go? Well, they'll be preached truth, but grace. We disagree, and I'm not compromising my truth, and they will say, hey, I, I'm not compromising my truth, but I'm gonna love you. The meet and greet after the service, by the way, this is what I love about our church, it's unfiltered for a lot of people. I have folks that walk in here, last service, from New Jersey, came to meet you. Can we take a picture? Cool, so glad you're here. Another conversation, I disagree with what you just said. That's what I love about our church. But here's the truth of the matter. Love wins, love wins but it has to be integrated with truth and grace. Don't miss what I'm saying. If we create top 10 list, I wanna just go ahead and double down on this, then what we've done is we started ranking sin. And I wanna just make this real clear. The Bible is an equal opportunity offender. So, so when we talk about transgenderism or homosexuality as a sin, it's just as sinful as you cheating on your taxes. It's just as sinful as slander and gossip. It's just as, it's just as sin, oh, don't, don't, don't leave now. We just getting started, all right? Don't leave now. We just get, so, so the truth of the matter is when we begin to understand that Jesus doesn't rank sin, so we don't rank sin, and here's how this works. The, the religious leaders of the day didn't see their own sin which is why Jesus tells three stories. That's really one story about being lost, found, party. No qualifiers, just lost, found, party. And that's what Jesus does. And Jesus teaches us how to love people. Jesus didn't compromise his message. J Jesus still was preaching with conviction but at the same time, he was willing, and don't miss this, willing to be misunderstood. Is anybody in the room that's gay or trans, I want you to know this, you're welcome here. I, I want you to hear this. I, I need you to know that, you're welcome here. You are loved here. 
And for anybody to treat you different, we'll handle it. We'll have words. But understand something for all of us. When the Bible speaks about sin, we don't rank them, but churches have a tendency to do this. People have a tendency to do this. My sin is not as bad as that sin. That's not who we are. So if we're going to define our mission is to champion every person to be the good news of Jesus in every place, every person is in need of Jesus. Every person. We're going to love every person. So for the person in the room that's been cheating on their taxes and they're like, um, convicted right now. Grace and mercy. For the person in the room that's been struggling with an addiction, grace and mercy. For the person in the room that goes, man, I'm really not doing well in the father category, grace and mercy. For the child that goes, man, I've been quite rebellious to my parents, grace and mercy. See, grace and mercy comes packaged in the essence of Jesus, in grace, in truth. And Jesus was willing to be misunderstood because he did not hang out with a certain group of people and become completely fake around another group of people. He was the consistent essence of grace and truth in front of religious people and also people that were labeled by their sin. And if we're going to be a church that welcomes home prodigals, we have to understand that we were lost, found, party. Because what happens if you ain't careful, you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. I've been walking with Jesus for over 30 years. It's easy to hold people to a standard of living that you've been walking through for 30 plus years. But what if I were to tell you this is brand new for some people in the room? This whole read your Bible and do what it says is brand new for some people in the room. And they need some people to come alongside of them and work it out. Instead of a condemning spirit, an uplifting spirit, a spirit of going, hey, listen, let's do this together. The very spiritual maturity you have, somebody else may not have, but how will they gain a spiritual maturity if they don't have somebody walking with them? What we're saying is this, we'll be a church that celebrates the steps that people take towards Jesus, which are all different in a different length, in a different space, in a different time. But when we begin to embrace this, this purpose of the parables, Jesus was speaking to two groups of people. Oh, I got to move faster. I lingered a little bit longer on point number one. But point number two, I want you to see the parallel in the parables. The parallel in the parables. Now, I won't have time to read all of the prodigal son's story, but I'll seek to summarize it. But I, can, I think I could read these two stories with the time that we got. It says, now the tax collectors and the sinners are listening. So he tells them a parable. What man... Of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it, on, lays it on its shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So I tell you, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, let me just pause. Jesus does not pontificate or even elaborate on the story. He, he's telling three stories, but it's really one story, lost, found, party. So as they're hearing this, now imagine Jesus is talking to two groups of people. They're hearing about a shepherd. One sheep gets lost. He leaves the 99, goes after the one. Who, who do you think identifies with the story? The religious people or the sinners? The sinners are like, thank you, God, that I got a savior that goes after the one. And you go, Ed, what about the 99? There's power in togetherness. See, I, I wanna just make this statement. I don't have time to elaborate on this as well. But what the devil always wants to do is to get you away from the fold. But see, there's power in togetherness. But when the shepherd goes after the sheep in its utter exhaustion, puts it on its shoulders and brings it back to the fold, then he moves into another story because he now ends that story with heaven rejoices over one versus 99 that don't repent. Who's he talking to? Religious leaders. 
transitions into another story. It says, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, by the way, if you don't know the context of this, and if I could just be quite confessional, I just learned this this week. Can I tell you, I don't have all the Bible answers. I'm on the journey just as you are, and I learned something this week I didn't know, and I wanna share it with you. That headband, that headdress would have been a statement that she was married. She would have received that at her wedding day as a statement, I'm now a spouse, I'm, I'm married, I'm a mom, a woman of worth and value. I just wanna put this in parentheses to all the women in the room, all the young ladies in the room. I want you to know that there's a headband of value upon you that God has placed upon you. You are so beautiful in the eyes of God. I want you to know the significance of your value in the kingdom of God. Never settle for second best in your life because God's got the best for you. And I believe that about you. But one coin from her headdress falls, falls into a crack in a crevice. So what does she do? She doesn't just take the headband off and not wear it again. She actually lights a lamp and begins to sweep and she finds it. And what does she say? Rejoice with me. And they gather and rejoice. The third story, and I won't read all the details of it. There's a son and a father, there's actually two sons. It goes from 100 sheep, 10 coins, to two sons, two sons. And the son comes to the father and he goes, I want my inheritance now, which is a way of looking at someone. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know this, that if you're asking for the inheritance now to a father that's living, you're making a statement indirectly going, I wish you were, fill in the blank, dead. I don't want your rules, I don't want your restrictions, I don't want your regulations, I'm done. By the way, the world, and when I say the world, I'm talking about culture, culture will sell you a lie that it's better out there in the far distant country. He comes to himself, it's a moment of repentance, he comes home, the father's been waiting for him, looking for him, and we watch the son be restored with his father. What's interesting about this in, in the connection of this teaching, this parallel in this parable, as we see the significance of a sheep being restored, a coin being found, and a son being reconciled. We, we see what happens when one is lost and found, there's celebration. But what makes this story so unique to me is that actually you see this rescue the revelation, the restoration is the fact that the loss was noticed. Don't, don't miss this. The loss was noticed. The lost was felt. The one sheep gone. The shepherd doesn't go, well, I got 99. Goes after the one. The woman doesn't go, I got nine coins. What's one? Stops everything, goes after the one. But you go, Ed, I, I don't see the father pursuing is because this son already had a predetermined plan. I'm gonna live this way. And for the father to pursue and try to convince, the son had to come to a place in his own life where he recognized that what's out there will never satisfy, that actually what is best for my life is home. What's best for my life is a father that loves me. So I'll come home as a servant and guess what happens? Instead of becoming a servant, the father gives him a robe and a ring and a, a pair of sandals, which was an essence of saying, you're not a servant here. And the father says, kill the fattened calf. It's time to party. And when you and I think about this story in the parallel, I think about what happens when you lose something and you find something. For, for example, when my daughter, and she's in the room today, and her, her name's Liv, and she's a senior in high school, but when she was little, I was preaching at a camp in Kentucky, and my wife was in Thailand on a mission trip, and I had the responsibility of taking care of our two daughters, our other two kids with, with some other family members. We had to divide and conquer because I couldn't handle four at one time, and so I took two, <laughs> Lola and Liv, and I went to preach at a camp, and for those of you that don't know this, I'm fluent in sign language, and with my kids, they, they knew what this meant. 
That's the word stop now. So while I was preaching, and this happened often, I, I would take my kids with me and they would sit in the back and they would doodle and color with crayons and crafts. And I would look at them while I was preaching. And if they were acting up, I, I could all of a sudden make this. And they knew exactly what I was saying. As the, like nobody knew what I was saying, but my kids knew like, oh, we just got called out. And nobody knew that we just got called out. Stop now. But I was giving an invitation at a camp I was preaching at, asking students to give their lives to Jesus and kids were coming forward and live. Little live at that time, walk forward and live. I should have handled that a whole lot better. I, um, I thought you were coming to snitch on your sister. And, and so, I, and I told her, I was like, hey, go sit back down, I'm almost done. And I'll never forget, Liv looked at me and she goes, no, 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 dad. I just gave my life to Jesus with all these high school kids and middle school kids, a little elementary school girl walks for my daughter. Can, can I tell you what I did? I jumped off the stage. It's like, y'all could figure this thing out. I <laughs> scooped up my little girl. And in that moment, tears, boo-hoo, snot, slobber moment. And all I could think about is if I rejoice this way, how does heaven rejoice? And if heaven rejoices over one, so shall we. And I know for many of us in the room, we, we go, okay, Ed, what, what, is, what is the driving message of this? What, what's the point of this? Lost, found, party. Jesus talking to two audiences, people going, Jesus, I, I'm digging this. I love lost sheep, you go after it. Lost coin, pursuit, father, embrace, but watch the principle. But Jesus shares that last story about the parable of the lost son. Where's the brother? Not at the party. Your son has spent everything. He says this on prostitutes. Where's the elder brother? So watch this. The father didn't really lose one son. He lost two sons. One son comes home. But the elder son's going, I've been following all the rules. What's the blessing? Now watch this. Who is Jesus calling the elder brother? Pharisee. The Pharisees. See how Jesus could tell one story, three stories, one story, lost, found, party. Pharisees are going, we're not lost. So we ain't gotta be found. And Jesus, we actually have a problem with the fact that you party over these people because they're not worthy of being partied over. But Jesus goes, because you don't know what it's like to be lost and found. See, the moment we forget what it was like to be lost and found, then we're not as patient or gracious with people in the process. Because sometimes we, we try to clean people up before we get them in the church. But this is the place to come and get cleaned up. This is the place where Jesus goes, I see all of what's going on. You've come to the right place. Because religion is about behavior modification, not heart transformation. I want you to know if you're choosing to be a part of CBC, and I pray that you would, we, we believe that the outside should reflect the inside, but we don't begin from the outside in, we start from the inside out. When Jesus gets a hold of someone's heart, I promise you, language starts changing movies start changing, music starts changing, the things we do start changing. You, all of a sudden you find yourself in an environment and you go, I don't even feel like I belong here anymore. My, my soul is conflicted. And then you go, I still love you people, but man, I, I've been delivered out of that. I can't go back to that. And so all of a sudden you, you start going, I, 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 I don't know what to do. I, I used to be in this world and now I'm in this world. And you go, no, I'm all in. I, I got to be all in. But watch this, but there's a lot of people on the outside looking in that need to know the hope of who Jesus is. And what if I were to say, that's why you got to be good news, because if you ain't, who will? Who will? And today, lost, found, party teaches us as a church, this has to be a core value for us. And I wanna bring this to point number three, which is the point of the parables. Well, what's the point of all of this? It's verse 32, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead, is alive, he was lost and is found. Can I, can I just make a couple just real quick bullet point statements? 
It's the value of the one. This happened at the eight o'clock service. I I didn't know it was gonna happen at the eight o'clock service. I was like, how many of you walk by pennies on the ground? And I'm that guy. Like I walk by pennies. But then there were a couple people that were like, yeah, I don't walk by pennies. And someone shouted out. They, they, they said, because when, when the penny is put into a pile of other pennies, it's got value. But, but I go, but that's the point. See, a penny with other pennies is of great value. But I walk by pennies and many of you walk by pennies because you go, I look at the one and I go, what's the value? See, don't miss this. There's value when the penny gets with other pennies and it stacks up and becomes 50 cents, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, but the coin by itself feels like it has no value. So what, what's the point of this whole message is that the sheep by itself finds value in togetherness. The coin by itself finds value in togetherness. The son finds value in togetherness with his father. But watch this. But Jesus gives value to the penny, even if it's not with other pennies. And he picks it up. Lost found party, which means if we're gonna live out our mission statement, then we have to rescue and relocate. That we would go from here, and this is amazing, but that we would see that we're entering into the mission field of what God's called us to in the workplace, on our campuses, on our teams, in the clubs, the gym, wherever you're at, that I could be a billboard. Your your, your life is a billboard, what's the message? It can't be confusing, it can't be camouflaged, it's got to be clear, it's about Jesus in your life. If Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, then we have to emulate what Jesus teaches us, that we would live on mission, lost, found, party. But new steps and new starts matter. I put this in the notes, here's the reason why, because we're a church that has an addiction recovery program. Hundreds of people come here on Friday nights with hurts, habits, and hangups. And it's actually one of the most prized ministries because think about this, people that go 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, guess what they get? They get a chip, but they put it on a keychain and it reminds them, reminds them of the progress and the starts in their life. But think about it, many of which are coming out of a lifestyle where, where you go to a bar and you slam a couple of shots and everybody's like, you can handle your liquor. But then you come into a church, choose to be sober for a week and read your Bible and nobody nobody claps. Let me see if I can put it this way. New starts and new steps matter to us. Anybody in the room could testify with what I heard last night. A brother stood into our meet and greet and goes, hey, listen, I've been addicted to weed for a long time and I've been trying to have a fresh start. Gave my life to Jesus here recently. Been coming to church and I'm grateful to be here. He goes, I, I've been sober for a week and the circle just goes crazy. And I go, what did that just do? It reinforced in him that we're going to celebrate every step. I think sometimes we wait for people to make the marathon before we give them the medal. But what if I were to tell you that this is a struggle and a battle for some that just need to go, hey, listen, the prize is Jesus. When we see him face to face, that's the reward and it's a marathon, but we're gonna cheer for you on that first step. We're gonna cheer for you in that next step. So let me just do something. Can I, can I just do something in this room, in the other room? Would it be all right? If you're celebrating sobriety right now at any level, if it's a day, a week, 15 years, 50 years, overflow in this room, just stand up right now. If you're in the room st- celebrating sobriety, just stand up. Come on, just stay standing. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. Overflow, you better be standing right now. Come on, we gotta cheer, clap. It's a big deal. Lives change, families change.
And you can be seated. I'm grateful for AA and I'm grateful for Celebrate Recovery and they cheer like crazy for those programs, in those programs, but the church, the church has to be a place that celebrates that. How about this one? Because for me, I'm, I'm, I'm so about helping understand when somebody chooses to go to church in a rhythm, as a discipline, read their Bible. How, how many of you go, Ed, this is new for me. Like, reading my Bible and coming to church, like this is brand new for me. I'm like, this is my new step, like doing this. Would you just stand right now? Anybody in the room going, reading my Bible, going to church, doing this thing is brand, like this is brand new. Anybody? Come on, can we just encourage them? seated. But oftentimes churches um, celebrate when they become the community group leader and they get into leadership and, and we should. But let, let me, a couple thoughts and my, I'm ADD and you got to hear, hear, hear what I'm saying right now. Um, when, yeah, I love it. <laughs> This is what I love. You're gonna to leave today and go, your friends are gonna be like, What's the par- what was the sermon about? You're like, party. That's all I heard today. I just heard party. That's all I heard. When, when my son walked out of his bedroom this morning, and he's serving in kids' church right now. He's about to be 16 this week. And I, I, I didn't go, Lawson, dude, you crushed it. Like you walked from the bedroom to the kitchen. It was amazing. Like, if I did, he'd be like, like, Dad, that's weird. But when he was little, we celebrated every step. Food on a spoon. all over his face and the moment he was able to what I'm saying is is that we do this in life we cheer for steps and stages and phases but somehow the church has lost its celebration over people and new steps of growth that one day they can go Pastor Ed I've learned how to read the Bible for myself I can feed myself. You go. That's it. That's it. I I learned how to tell somebody about Jesus. I I did it. Messed it up, but I did it. You you did it. I um I'll close. I'm I'm gonna close with this. Tony Campolo is a well-known preacher passed away several years ago. He, he wrote a book called The Kingdom of God is a Party. The Kingdom of God is a Party. He was in Honolulu uh, preaching at a conference and it was jet lag and he couldn't sleep and he went to a, a greasy spoon breakfast place that was kind of one of those 24 hour deals like Waffle House and um, yeah. you, you have a picture in your mind. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about but he, he, he's there at 3.30 in the morning and he's getting coffee and and a donut because he can't sleep. The time changed, he's preaching at this conference and at 3.30 in the morning, nine prostitutes walk in. And it's a really small little breakfast place and they're loud and boisterous and he uh, goes, I felt really uncomfortable. So he's about to get up, but one of the ladies just says out loud, like tomorrow's my birthday. And the other ladies didn't really receive it well. They're like, as the story is told, they were like, so, um, are we seven? Like, we celebrate birthdays, you know? And she's like, no, no, I'm not trying to make this a big deal. She goes, I've never had a birthday in 
celebration in my life. I've never had cake. It's, not, it's just, I'm just saying it. It's just my birthday. Well, Tony, being a preacher, um, on his way out, feels the Holy Spirit of God go, ooh. So he walks up to the owner of this little greasy spoon and just goes, did they come in here every night? He goes, every night at 3.30, they come in here. He goes, um, I, I'm just passing through. He said, but would it be okay that tomorrow night morning, 3.30 in the morning, can I go buy a cake and some birthday supplies of like streamers and banners and confetti and bugles and I mean, like, let's, can we throw a party for her tomorrow? And he goes, yeah. He goes, um, you don't have to get the cake. I'll make the cake, the owner. So it's 325, it's decorated. And nine prostitutes walk in. And this preacher named Tony and the owner and the wait staff, surprise, happy birthday. She buckles because no one's ever done that for her. They, they end up putting the cake in front of her and, and the owner goes, come on, just can we cut the cake? We all wanna have some cake with you and watch this. She goes, true story. She goes, I've never had cake in my life on my birthday. Would it be okay if we don't eat it? I just wanna keep it. <laughs> T- Tony um, Campolo begins to pray. Oh God, begins to pray for these women. And goes, um, God, power of Jesus, grace, mercy, change their stories. Amen. They can carry on, and the owner looks at Tony and goes, um, You didn't tell me you were a preacher. <laughs> he goes, I probably should have told you that. I, um, speaking at this conference. He goes, what kind of church do you go to? And this is what he says. I go to a church that throws parties to celebrate birthdays for prostitutes. That's the kind of church I go to. put the tension we feel in this room because I know there's somebody going, but did he preach Jesus? Did he tell him the hell? As we sit in that tension, that's the tension that Jesus felt when he was sitting with sinners and the religious leaders walked up. I want to be a part of a church, and we are. CBC is this church that celebrates people that take steps, but sometimes before they say yes to Jesus, and we never compromise the message of Jesus and truth, but we have to love like Jesus loved, to speak grace and truth in a way that goes, I'm so for you. And so is Jesus because he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. He goes after the one coin and he runs after the son and embrace. Come on, can we just clap right now? Can we just celebrate this? If you're in the overflow right now, I'm turning this over to Pastor Marquise or whoever's there in that moment. But let's, let's put this message into practice. If you are going, I wanna give my life to Jesus today. No greater decision than to say yes to Jesus. Lost, found, party. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, just pray this out loud. Let's just say this together. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, for I've sinned, but I believe in you. Save me, change me, I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer in faith, lost, found, party. Would you stand up right now so we could cheer and clap if you gave your life to Jesus today? If you said yes to Jesus today, come on, just stand up. Just stand up right now. Just stand up right now. Come on, just stay standing. 
stay standing. We have prayer partners moving to you. If you've said yes to Jesus today, we're handing you a Bible. Fill out that card, hand it back to that prayer partner or put it in the hands of somebody wearing a yellow shirt or in an offering box. But let's stand together. We got new brothers and sisters, y'all. Heaven is celebrating and so shall we. Rescue and relocate mission is what we say yes to. So Father God, I pray blessings over your people. God, thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. Lost, found, party. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless your church. We'll see you next weekend.